I won't make any bones about it. Today, I'm a sinner. I don't think that you're under any delusion that you are anything other than a sinner as well. But today, we Lutherans like to tout about the Reformation. Obviously, it being the Feast of the Reformation. However, and I am probably the biggest, uh, the biggest one who transgresses this more than anyone else in the church, I've become a little too proud of being Lutheran. Now when I say I am a little too proud of being Lutheran, it means that I truly 100% believe in our confessions. I believe that the truth of God's word is contained in them and that we truly confess what is meat, right, and salutary. Now, with that being said, obviously with my last name, I'm also very German. So I'm also very proud of being German. But I'm also Southern, which means I'm stubborn, but I bless your heart. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in, when, I, when I consider all of these things, I wonder if we Lutherans, and me in particular, if we get a little too high on our horse and we think that being Lutheran and having the moniker Lutheran is more important than what Lutherans actually believe. Luther, as many of you know, did not like the term Lutheran. He did not like it. He was named after his opponents. In other words, in those days, it would have been an expletive more than it would have been a compliment. It would have been something derogatory. Oh, you're Lutherans, which means you follow Luther and not Jesus. Then, of course, the Lutherans would turn around and say, but you're a papacy. You follow the Pope not Jesus. And therein lies the great conflict. Who do you say you belong to? Who do you say that you belong to? Are we children of the Reformation? Are we children of uh, a, a reformation that has the banner of sola or that uh, semper reformata always reforming no we're not we're not willing to go that far if we're always reforming then we're tossing the baby out with the bathwater and then the tub too in case people wonder why Augustana and many other Lutheran churches retained the worship styles in which they did in the Reformation is because of this. We're unwilling to toss the baby out with the bathwater. There are salutary things in worshiping according to a great tradition. And the early church does not belong to the Roman Catholic Church. The early church belongs to the church. And we are the church. Not merely with the name Lutheran, but what Luther brought out of Scripture and what he laid in front of his opponents to say, look, I am bound by the Word of God. By the Word of God alone am I held captive. I can do no other. Here I stand, so help me God. And in pulpits all across the United States, You'll, they, you'll be hearing those phrases, or people will be hearing those phrases time after time after time. Here I stand, I can do no other. And, they, and it, that quote is always linked to Luther. But Luther was not quoting Luther. Luther was speaking on behalf of all of us. So when we discuss and we talk about here I stand, I can do no other. My conscience is held captive by the Word of God. What that means is simply this. Luther spoke what we should be speaking every second of every day. We have sinned 
and we have fallen short of the glory of God. That's nothing new. You're not surprised by this. All, as much as you sin, and as much as I sin, understand when I say you, I'm, it's the, uh, the uh, British you. I'm including myself in it. As much as you sin, so much greater is the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But know this. We cannot get so into justification that we forget that there are laws from God. There are laws from God. And the question then is asked, this, is asked of you this. Does God still expect those commandments to be held? Yes. You shall have no other gods. That one commandment is all the commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do not love your neighbor as yourself, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot believe in God alone. And you have not been good to your neighbor. Thus, you have transgressed against God. You have made an idol out of relationships and we have faltered in our own to God. And when I say we make too much out of justification, I mean this. We make justification no longer a theological term, but an excuse to do whatever we want. We make a mockery of justification. We justify ourselves into sinning more and more and more. And we say this, don't worry, God will forgive me. Let's go have a good time. Let's go uh, hurt one another. Let's go uh, betray one another. Let us hurt. But then you have to ask. Well, let me, let me back up. That's not justification. Justification is this. That what Christ has done has made you just in the sight of God the Father. That's justification. Anything outside of that is just you convincing yourself that what you're doing is okay. And that's not justification. That's self-justification. And you may wonder why I know this so well. Maybe you don't wonder. It's because I do it too. In fact, I may be the worst transgressor, transgressor of this. I constantly feel the need to self-justify. To think that I'm right, and if I just keep plugging along, eventually the world is going to see it my way. I mean, I have the guts to admit it. But do I have the shame to repent of it? I hope so. I know that the Holy Spirit works in me to bring me to repentance and then reminds me of the justification that is Christ and not mine. And therein lies the difference. So I asked the question I asked before. Who do you belong to? Do you belong to Luther? Do you belong to Pope Frank? Do you belong to whom? Well, our text says it very simply. The Jews said, we, have, we are offspring of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Well, you can tell a person by their name. Abraham. We have Abraham as our father. And that was their uh, bona fide their, their uh, pedigree, their certification to say, we are of Abraham, therefore we have all the benefits of Abraham. Fine. I'll even, I'll, even, I'll even give that to you. If you claim Abraham as your father, you have all the benefits that Abraham can give. And that's this. Where is Abraham now? Dead. Like everyone else. So if you claim 
the earthly man as your father, you will follow the benefits of him. You will die. To dust you are and to dust you shall return. Yet, if you confess Christ, who is true God and true man, then we have a completely different situation. We have a completely different story, don't we? We have Christ who died for you and rose for you, and you will receive the benefits from that God-man. And what is that? Where is He now? Sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge both the quick and the dead. You see, when Luther died, he had this to say. We are all beggars. This is true. I don't know what it is in German, but that's the gist of it. We are beggars. And I believe that there was a conditional statement in there that said we alone, or we only, are beggars. This is true. And that is true. In this whole life, we're beggars. From the moment we're born into the world, we're begging for food, shelter, love, baptism, and at the end of our life, we are begging for food, shelter, and resting, love and resting in our baptism. But that also means that we're bound. We're bound to a life of sin. The same sin that you're born into, you die in. Because the wages of sin is death. Freedom is Christ Jesus. So you see the predicament we're in. Shakespeare once said that all of life is a stage. And what he means is that you come up on one side, you give a performance, and you go down on the other. Christians say this. I don't buy it. We enter onto the stage, we go down the stage, and then we realize that the great orchestrator of the play has given us a greater part. And that part is given to us from His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that part is eternal life, the forgiveness of sins. So today, when we rejoice in the Reformation, we're not rejoicing in Luther, we're rejoicing in this, that you are, your bounds have been broken and you are freed from sin, and you are freed from death, and you are freed from the devil. But re remember that the law still accuses. Repent quickly, forgive one another even more quickly, love one another. Put everything away. Put it aside. And know this, that if Christ loved you enough to die for you, then when you die, you will know that Christ Jesus did it so that you would be with Him. Salvation isn't the great one-trick pony where Jesus says, look what I can do. I can die and rise again. No, none of it means anything if it doesn't mean that you have salvation. And that's what Christ says. I call you my own. And so I'm not willing to go as far as to say nothing in this world matters, but I will say this. You will see, and mark my words, you will see when you are looking at God through, through Christ and the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabbath, there in heaven, you will, you will look over to Luther and, and, uh, and, and say to him, Thank you. You have rescued us from the bounds of a papacy. You have rescued us from the bounds of a truth that was corrupt. You have given us the true faith. Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone. And in that, 
we repent and we hear the words of Christ in Scripture. I forgive you of all of your sins. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. And in there, everything gets washed away. For one moment, for one moment, ask yourself if you could do that for anyone else. Could you actually forgive them completely? Could everything be wiped away regardless of what someone has done for you or to you, against you? Could you completely forgive without hard feelings or hurt or anything? The answer is yes, in case you were wondering. Not by your own power or your own will, but by the Holy Spirit whom Christ Himself sent. Every time you forgive someone, you are speaking the words of Christ. And when you forgive someone and you speak the words of Christ, then, then you are speaking salvation unto them. And they will know you by your Father and the Father's Son and the Holy Spirit. That way we don't claim Abraham or Luther or anyone else outside of this. Christ, I am a Christian. That is little Christ. And I carry that sign on my forehead. But not a lot of people can see that. So open your mouths and speak forgiveness of Christ. Do not be shy and don't expect an easy road. But keep your hand to the plow. For eventually, you'll realize that in this world, as we plow, we eventually come to our own graves. But fear not. You will say, Pastor Mize was right. It's all true. Behold, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. And that means your sins and the sins that I spoke of at the beginning of the sermon. Mine. And nothing is more important to you than when it becomes personal to you. So when Christ died on the cross, remember His words. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Forgive them. Personal, isn't it? On this Reformation Day, don't wear the badge of being a German Lutheran. Wear the badge of a forgiven sinner. If you want to celebrate the Reformation, go forgive somebody. Go be a little Christian. Go love your neighbor. Put all pride aside. Just care. The Reformation came about this way. A search for the truth. And now we can read it for ourselves. And while we may take it for granted, let me be the one to remind you that truth has set you free. Thanks be to God. Amen.